Portfolio Builder members, we're a day away from Thanksgiving. We'll see if all the giddy market uh, hype continues or if we get some volatility into December. We've locked in our profits on the SPY after successfully predicting this crazy 315 on the SPY. We're about 20 cents from tapping that and I predicted this quite some time ago. Here's a tweet from Global Times, a China publication essentially. If Trump administration refuses to roll back high tariffs, the vast number of American farmers could face a loss of exports to the Chinese market and the loss could be permanent if the trade war lingers longer. If you listen to Trump's rally in Florida last night, uh, he said that China is not stepping up to the bat. SPY ETF delivers $9,769 of profits over the last 11 trade alerts. Gotta love that little cartoon right there, hugging the dollar bill. Uh, you can see back on October 28th, I predicted a 315 SPY on trade hopes. And I'm also predicting a 330 SPY if we can close a phase one deal. Although if I had to uh, put my money on it, I would bet no trade deal in 2019. In fact, I would bet no trade deal, period. Uh, especially when we go look at the two year history of these guys uh, slinging uh, tariffs back, at, back and forth at one another. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. Let's start off by looking at how our total portfolio operates and more importantly, what we're going to do when the S&P 500 begins to sell off. So if you're feeling lucky uh, that you've generated such a huge return this year after seeing 8% drawdowns in August, 8% drawdowns in May, and 16% drawdowns last December, you wanna buckle up for safety Listen to this video, daily income trade alerts at noon Eastern. We trade the SPY ETF Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the Emerging Markets ETF on Tuesday, the TLT and GDX ETFs on Thursday. Target income is $750 a month per $75,000 invested. Our goal is to average 1% a month, although we've averaged 1.35% to date. This is over the past 12 months. We're about to close out our 12th months. We've had one losing month out of the past 12, and that month only lost 1%. Over a 90-day period, we've never lost money. So you can bet that this is attractive to wealthy investors who aren't concerned about getting big gains. They're more concerned about protecting their nest egg. Now, if you're nervous that the S&P 500 has gotten ahead of itself, you should be. We'll take a look at why in this video, but I want to point out our strategy has done extremely well in periods of drawdown. In fact, that's when most clients join our service, not when stocks are going up. That's when anybody can make money. When stocks go flat and down and they're feeling pain, people gravitate to this strategy. So you can see in May with that huge sell off, we pulled in a 2.2% return. In August, another 7% sell-off. We picked up 0.8. And I want to point out how we play the markets determined uh, on this trade war. So currently, we're up in the air. We don't know if the trade war is going to escalate or de-escalate. And in this environment, with low interest rates that are actually heading lower, not just in America, but everywhere, 60% of all central banks are lowering interest rates, we're not facing high levels of inflation, at least by the measurement the Fed looks at, uh, which is what we're worried about, is when the, the biggest buyer and seller of assets starts changing their strategy, we just wanna copy what they're doing. So I pay close attention to the Fed, and I can tell you they have no, no expectation of raising interest rates anytime soon. In fact, if you read their latest FOMC minutes, uh, all they're talking about is what they're going to do when they hit zero, which they call the effect of lower bound. And now they're talking about whether zero is the effect of lower bound. They're talking about permanent repo. And they're also talking about uh, setting a limit on how high bond yields can travel because they're scared that when we do get to zero, the bond bubble is going to burst. If the bond bubble bursts, it will take stocks down with you. Uh, today we sold the 316 
and bought the 315, Henry. And I'll double check that trade alert in a minute. So when we're up in the air with the trade war, we're going to be long the SPY, the emerging markets, the TLT, and very tight with GDX, so relatively flat. Uh, and when things change, we can change our strategy. So if we're in the period of an escalating trade war, we're going to use an inverted option caller to be able to buy and hold SPY in emerging markets and profit from a crash. Uh, now, I think both of those products could crash substantially if the trade war escalates, at least for several weeks, maybe several months. In this situation, we'd be long the bonds and gold, and again, short the SPY in emerging markets. We still own the assets, but we can use option callers to profit from different directions. And if we're in a period of major de-escalation, uh, we want to be short the bond market and the gold market and long equities. So with those three strategies, uh, we can hold these same assets and profit in various market conditions. It just gets easier once we know if we're going to escalate or de-escalate. When it's up in the air, uh, it's a little bit harder to trade the markets. We want to have expensive puts protecting the downside because we're no, we're, we know that we're very close to a catalyst that's going to send the markets in one direction or the other. So this is our bullish loose option caller. You can see we sell an out-of-the-money call and buy an out-of-the-money put. This gives us the most risk and the most reward. As we get towards uh, a topping point where we think the market won't travel much higher, but it's probably not ready to crash between this period and the next, we put on a tight option caller. This is very close to what we put on today, except I put the put option very close to the current trading price and the call option we sold a little bit higher. Okay guys, uh, let me look at the trade alert email and see what happened here. So sell to open the 316 Call and buy to open the 315 put. Did we put a mistake in the text message? Yes, we did. Okay, I'll get a fixed text message out right away. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so the image is correct in this case. Uh, thanks guys, sorry about the mistake. So the image is correct. And essentially our goal today is to lock in all the profits we've generated and then to uh, catch a big run up in the TLT. That's really what I'm expecting. Timing's difficult. I don't expect an escalation the day before Thanksgiving, but we can see China is in some serious pain and getting upset that we're not rolling back the tariffs. Um, so let's jump into let me get a fixed trailer down. Okay, guys, so currently we're stuck in this tight option caller. We predicted the SPY would travel up to 315. I don't think it's going to go much higher than 315 without a trade deal. And it looks like unless Trump is really willing to bend over backwards, roll back all the tariffs, forget about the trade war altogether, uh, China is willing to wait this one out. So as soon as we do get a catalyst and a little bit of a sell-off, we'll be excited to sell the inverted option caller. So we sell an in-the-money call option and we buy an in-the-money put. And so this will allow us to profit from a down move in the uh, SPY if we do escalate. Now again, I'm not positioning ourselves to guess what's going to happen. Uh, if if the trade war does escalate, we're set. We have the long TLT position, which will benefit greatly from a escalation in the trade war as well as GDX. If the trade deal continues to have some progress, uh, we've seen that the TLT is not selling off significantly. 
Uh, it already had that massive crash over the last two months, so I think the uh, yields on the TLT are fixed. The big picture for the TLT is it must travel higher for a long time until we get to the zero band. And again, that's what the Fed's planning. They're planning to take us to zero and hope that we can get some serious GDP growth between now and reaching the effective lower bound. Uh, so again, just to reiterate, we're ready to react to what happens with the trade war. It's going to make a huge impact on the markets. If we're up in the air, we want to be long all of these assets with tight put options below. All of these assets are extremely overvalued in terms of U.S. stocks and U.S. bonds. Emerging markets and gold are not, uh, but they do play an important part in our portfolio strategy. If the trade war escalates, we will use the inverted option caller on the SPY and emerging markets for a short period of time until we see the TLT ramp up much higher and hit some technical levels. I'm not ready to be short the SPY until the TL for a long period of time until the credit market really cracks because corporations are just borrowing money and if this does happen, they'll be able to borrow money at even cheaper rates than possible. And if we de-escalate the trade war, again, we will want to be short the TLT and GDX for a very short period of time until that yield gets too attractive and then expect money to flow out of the SPY into uh, the bond and gold market. Okay, so here's again a review of the three option callers we'll be using. We have the bullish loose option caller. This is when we think the asset will travel higher with relatively low downside risk. That's not where we're at in this point in time. This is our tight option caller, which we'll use when we get to elevated prices, which is where we're at exactly right now in the stock market, uh, but less so in the bond market. And then this is when we have a real catalyst to push an asset lower we can flip the option caller upside down and profit from a down move while still owning the asset. So what's really clever about this is we're able to own the asset, sell an in the money call for a huge premium, in this example $219, and then turn around and use that $219 to buy our downside protection on the put. So our simple Ford ETF portfolio is extremely diversified and all you'll need for your retirement income and safety, not growth or speculation. Simplify your holdings, reduce your risk, get better results with less work, and weatherproof your retirement portfolio. For those of you listening, and for a lot of you, uh, like Henry, for example, who are just trading the SPY, I think you've had a good run on the SPY. You're going to want to have our TLT trades and GDX trades when this trade war escalates. We have a deal there's two spots left. You're going to get a free month in our $10,000 boot camp. Call Dean by the end of today at 505-322-7515. Let's upgrade your account and get you in our boot camp. All right, let's take a look at the trade alert once again. Uh, so as some people in our live chat pointed out, I had a small mistake. The text message had the wrong strikes. We are sending out a fixed text message right now. That's what's so beautiful about this live stream. We go live. We can answer questions from our members and then broadcast this to the expired list uh, at the market close. So we had to close out the 314 call. The put option expired worthless because it was only worth a penny. And then we rolled into the 316, 315 option caller. What does this mean? Well, uh, as you can see at this point, the put option was a higher strike than the trading price. So I'm actually getting a guaranteed price tag of 315 per share of the SPY, no matter what happens. We could have an atomic bomb go off in North Korea over the holiday weekend and wake up Monday with the SPY below 290. We're still getting 315 a share. Now we had to pay a premium of $1.02 for that right, uh, but it's well worth it to lock in these profits. On the other side, we collected 28 cents, so if the market does continue to melt up, we will benefit slightly. The maximum risk on this trade is 31 cents a share, or $31 per uh, rack of 100 shares of the SPY, and the maximum profit is only 68 cents. So we're not trying to get greedy, we're trying to lock in the profits. 
If I do scroll up, you can see we've had uh, some great returns on the SPY in the most recent months. Uh, but I do suspect we will be uh, performing much better on the TLT very soon uh, because I think this market is overvalued and I don't think China wants a trade deal, not unless we completely give up on the trade war. And I don't think that's going to sell well in Washington. So in November, we're up 2% on the SPY, 1% in October. And this is after some bumpy months through the summer. Uh, and so it doesn't come all at once, but you can see uh, the SPY has been very handsome to us. Did we capture all the gains on the SPY? Absolutely not. Did we do it with less volatility than the market? Yes. So if we compare our risk to reward, we have a profit of around 15%. Let's look at our total return. We've generated a 15% return in the course of a year with the S&P 500 having volatility of up to 16% during that time period. So for those of you who've held on to your S&P 500, uh, you're just about back to even from last October, uh, and you've had to experience some extreme volatility, about a one-to-one -one ratio of volatility versus reward. In our portfolio, we've delivered 15% gains with a maximum volatility of 1%. So if you're a wealthy investor, you like strong risk to reward ratios, that's why this strategy is so popular with big accounts. Let's take a look at the news that will give you reason to question this value of the S&P 500. Okay, so Global Times, uh, China is getting anxious, Trump's getting anxious. If the Trump administration refuses to roll back high tariffs, the vast number of American farmers could face a loss of exports to the Chinese market, and the loss could be permanent if the trade war lingers longer. So they've already been uh, taking the process of changing their purchasing out of the United States. This is from the long view. We've had a few positive developments in the past few months, more QE and rate cuts. So we're up to $300 billion in overnight repo right now. Uh, spread out at different time lengths, uh, but that's still a whole lot of money and that's being given to the banks. Hard Brexit's off the table, worst of the tariffs likely behind us. That I am seriously questioning. Uh, warming to fiscal stimulus in EU. Uh, Warren is waning in the polls. She has been dropping like a rock recently, uh, which is interesting. And Korean Japanese detente. This is from Nordea. We stay defensive, overweight bonds versus equities. Also, keep in mind, JP Morgan just loaded up on bonds. Uh, they increased their bond portfolio by 50%. JP Morgan is by far the most connected bank in the world to the government and to the Fed. They are now able to purchase 25% of all the treasuries issued, and then they're turning around and flipping it to the Fed days and weeks later. They're not supposed to be doing that. It's outrageous. It's guaranteed profits for J.P. Morgan, and it signals that there could very well be some tr trouble ahead. Also, think about Warren Buffett. Is he loading up on stocks and buying out companies right now? No, he has a record cash pile. He has the biggest cash pile of any fund in the world at this point in time. True Bears, high level of uncertainty could delay investment in boardroom decisions. Phase two of the global slowdown, moving from manufacturing to services and labor market. Earnings recession will likely continue and deepen. Valuations back at multi-year highs. For the bulls, liquidity feeds activity. Green shots are gaining traction. Bond pricing is the real imbalance. A shallow earnings recession can be absorbed. Here's a look at the repo market. Uh, which, remember, they had an emergency meeting two months ago and decided to start uh, start up not QE, but this is certainly QE. In fact, this is the fastest growth of the Fed's balance sheet in history. So will it slow down or is it going to ramp up? Uh, right now we know they'll, they've committed to $60 billion a month until the second quarter of 2020. Um, but I'll tell you this, every single time the Fed has cut rates 75 basis points, there's been a recession. They don't cut rates because they think there's good times ahead. So we got 
Powell saying America's glass is more than half full, everything's grand, and then we read their FOMC minutes, and it's 18 pages talking about how they're going to deal with the effective lower bound when they hit 0% on interest rates. So the big picture is that China is crashing. They're allowing their economy to crash. They're not growing their credit, and they know that this will put a huge effect on emerging markets and eventually stir its way over to America. So they're actually holding themselves back in terms of uh, credit expansion. Now, when we do look at the big picture of China, they don't know what to spend the money on. They've printed $210 trillion, and now they've just printed another $1 trillion, uh, won, uh, which is about $21 U.S. trillion dollars if you believe their conversion rate value, uh, which I do not. Okay, so here's J.P. Morgan's global manufacturing PMI. Uh, it was crashing rapidly. That's why all the central banks rush to print money, lower rates. It's bouncing a little bit. Will it be enough to save the day? Question, questionable. Uh, here's the PMI by the Consumer Intermediate Investment. All of these are in a strong downtrend. There are $229 billion of Chinese dollar bonds outstanding with low or no credit ratings, up from $8.7 billion in 2014. So China really needs U.S. dollars to be able to buy imports. Go figure this. We have a, a deficit of $500 billion with China, and they turn around and they pretty much take that entire $500 billion and import commodities uh, so that they can build all these lavish uh, construction projects. Started off with cities. That stopped working after they built about 10. So they have 25 massive cities that are empty. They have 55 million uh, houses they've built that are just the, uh, the skeleton that are all crumbling away. And now they're building uh, $22 billion airports and they want to switch over to the Belt and Road uh, because they're learning that they've constructed so much stuff that's totally useless their debt to GDP is growing uh, at a very alarming rate. Here's a look at the central banks. They've added a uh, trillion dollars just in the most recent period of time and seven trillion total in 2019 uh, to their balance sheets. World gold reserve is climbing rapidly and this is primarily because of weaker countries currencies are devaluing at a rapid pace against the dollar and unfortunately everyone has issued all of their debt in dollars so now to pay these debts they print more money and that money uh, that they're printing in their foreign currency has to be exchanged into dollars so it continues to drive the dollar higher their currency lower making the ability to pay their interests more difficult over time just in, the Ministry of Finance said it has granted 1 trillion won uh, for 2020 special purpose bond to local governments. So the big scheme of the governments is uh, they take some of the uh, government land, flip it to a builder, the builder flips it to another builder, and they keep driving these prices higher and higher. Uh, and every sale has to be approved by the local government. So of course, prices never go lower, they only go up. There's no free market. That's why the value of the one is severely overvalued and in our boot camp program we're getting ready to pull the trigger to short their currency in the futures market. Deutsche Bank is said to have sold securities tied to emerging market debt worth 50 billion to Goldman Sachs. Uh, so it's the more I study these foreign markets and their currencies which have all gone into hyperinflation uh, mode uh, with dramatic devaluations. I think it's these emerging markets who are in serious trouble and that's quite likely driving this repo market uh, illiquidity. Global car sales crashing primarily in China. China's industrial profits crashing like it did in 2015, which was the last time we almost had a market meltdown. Uh, but unfortunately, China's debt to GDP is nearly at 300% now, and they've stopped increasing the debt uh, several years ago. So they're trying to restructure uh, their economy and get it productive once again. Uh, now there's bank runs happening in China. More than 13% of China's banks were rated high risk by the central bank. 
They've had to bail out something like five medium-sized banks this year. Latest phone conversation between Chinese and U.S. top trade negotiators attracted little public attention in China. People have been numb to the news of trade talks. I was asked a lot whether China and the U.S. can reach a deal in the past. Now few ask. They asked me about Hong Kong. But for a nation with a $40 trillion financial system, double the size of U.S. banks and well over 4,000 small, medium, and massive state-owned banks, here, please recall that the four largest banks in the world are now Chinese. In our latest look at turmoil among China, small and medium banks, which included not only the recent bailouts and nationalizations of the Baosheng Bank, the Bank of Jingzhou, Hang Feng Bank, but also the two very troubling bank runs at China's Henan Yuan Rural Commercial Bank at the start of the month, and then more recently, at Yingku Coastal Bank. And although they do have a firewall. Oh, thanks, Oscar, for the shout out. John, Ernest, Henry, Ron, shout out to everybody live. I love it when you guys make it live with us. Uh, so, $20 trillion problem, more than half of China's banks fail central bank stress test. And so China had a, here's the big picture. China was growing their, their uh, foreign reserves at the same rate they were growing their money supply for quite some time, and then it broke away. And so they've maintained around $4 trillion of reserves, primarily U.S. dollars and the euro, uh, which they can use to actually buy things. No one wants their currency. Uh, and then they grew the value of their currency to above $20 trillion. So there's a huge discrepancy in what they claim their currency is worth versus uh, the reserves they have to back it up. And there's no free market to sell their currency. So it's, it's really trapped and highly overvalued. So this is my most convicted, uh, most highly conviction trade for 2020 is to short China's currency. And this is a play we should be able to do for five to 10 years. Uh, so we'll be using the futures market for that. Chinese bond repo spiking, just like we're seeing in the US. Here's another uh, photo of a bunch of Chinese trying to rush to get their money out. And if you remember, we had a sell off in crypto last week. They are putting massive capital controls trying to prevent any of their currency to get out of China. Trump says he's holding up the deal with China. It's got to be good. He was doing a speech in Florida last night and commented that China has not stepped up to the bat. Uh, but I think China knows if they don't step up to the bat, they can cause a global recession and that there's never been a president reelected during a recession. So tricky times to predict how these two will react to this uh, opinion. China may not need to play the rare earth card for the time being, but it is still essential to keep vigilant and ensure the deterrent effect of this crucial trade war bargaining chip. So we saw China being really positive for the last several weeks, uh, as well as the U.S. Both pa parties were saying everything was grand. Now we're starting to see the narrative change. Uh, this is a photo of a bunch of companies who's been leveraging their debt higher and who's been deleveraging. And the bad news is just about everyone's been taking advantage of low rates, borrowing up money, and uh, increasing their leverage ratios. In fact, it's 0.53 uh, times higher in 2019 versus the start of 2018. That's a huge increase in credit. A little bit of pickup in durable goods orders, which could be suspected from low rates. This is the most concerning chart. This repo operation was supposed to be a couple days. Now it's turned into several months. Now it's going into 2020. If we do read the FOMC meetings, they're talking about making this permanent. So all the banks would have easy access to capital at all times, no matter what. Of course, this would cause them to use it as a handicap and uh, quite likely not a smart move for the financial system in the long run. Real rates are negative in most advanced economies. So if you strip away 
the yield versus the expected inflation rate, which we know is artificially much lower than it really is. Uh, these bonds are worthless. That's why the Fed is stuck. If they were to raise rates, everybody would sell their bonds at rapid pace. The only reason anyone is buying them is because they think the central bank will buy it for them at a lower cost as they drop rates globally. What could change this picture? If we're able to create better growth, greater growth than debt, that's what they need to solve this problem. Uh, but because of the tremendous debt and the interest we're paying on it, it's really hard to get out of the hole. All the money that you do make just pays off the interest on your debt. Uh, you're not even paying down the principal. And if you're an emerging market country, the value of your currency is worth, uh, on average, between half to 25% of what it was just five years ago. So imagine uh, your debt interest payments have doubled or quadrupled. That's the case for most emerging market countries. In fact, there's very, very few countries who've been able to maintain a relative value against the dollar. Russia, who has extremely high cost of capital, I think their federal, their uh, central bank rates around 8% or something insane, and their debt levels are tiny. Now the cost of that was low growth, uh, but they were one of the few countries to maintain their currency against the dollar. Uh, Japan has done it as well, but what was the cost? They have the highest public debt in the world. So think about all these generations coming in who are going to have to pay these massive debts that this generation has created for their country. And now Japan owns something like 60% of its stock market. It's had zero growth for decades. It's a mess. Hopefully that's not where the U.S. is headed, but if you read into those FOMC minutes, a lot of that verbiage sounds a whole lot like it. I don't know who Luke Kawa is, but I liked his piece. Boring volatility in every asset class is at least half a standard deviation below its one-year average. Stocks, treasuries, high yield, oil, and forex. So this is just a bunch of different volatility products showing uh, how low they've dropped. For our Friday trade, for the boot camp, most likely we'll be buying another VIX call option. Just a heads up. I uh, haven't had time to analyze that, so I'm going to skip that. New home sales can be a long leading indicator. So you drop rates to zero, free up all the bank's balance sheets, and what do you know? We've got people buying houses. Um, so I think that we have really distorted the markets with free money, and this is one heck of a bubble. Uh, so far this year, the U.S. 60-40 portfolio has had its best year since 1998. So this does tie into what we do quite uh, considerably, although uh, from time to time we're heavier in the bonds. And we're doing a step beyond this. So instead of just owning, say, your TLT and SPY, which is what this is, we're adding in the option callers. So we're able to uh, really reduce volatility compared to this. Now you can see in this chart, uh, it's saying the, the worst drawdown you would have had over the last uh, 50 years would have been about 20%. Uh, with just a buy and hold with this strategy. Uh, and that would be a one-year total return. I think you would actually have greater drawdown in certain months, especially during the 2008 crisis. Now, with our strategy, it's a lot better because if the stock market crashes, our put option kicks in and immediately cuts off the losses on the SPY, and then it allows the TLT to generate the return. Commercial loans continue to climb $2.2 trillion. U.S. liquidity seems to be back under control. It only took $300 billion injected into uh, the bank system. Most of that's probably in J.P. Morgan's hands. Healthcare inflation is running at 20%. Now, sure, you do get a lot more from your health care now than you did 5, 10, or 20 years ago, uh, but it's very uh, handy for the Fed to strip out things like health care, college, and rent out of their uh, measurements for when they should be raising interest rates. Uh, now, this is funny. I pointed this out way before anyone else. Uh, all you had to do was read the FOMC minutes. Fed's 
Brannard argues for capping interest rate levels during the next downturn. So that's what I've been talking about. Monday in our boot camp, we went over this uh, in a brief detail, not in great detail. Meanwhile, the impeachment continues next week, and they've invited Trump to testify. Although it does seem like the polls are turning against this, and we had the first Democrat uh, come out publicly against it. And meanwhile, this is shocking. Joe Biden is apparently back in the, uh, the highest odds for winning the Democratic presidential nomination, uh, which I can't believe. The guy can't even say a sentence in live debates. Absolutely horrific per performance. I highly doubt it will be Joe Biden, uh, but it does seem like the Democratic Party wants to push him in there as, as much as they can. Um, if we do go to a Senate trial, uh, perhaps in January or February, if perhaps the House does vote for impeachment, uh, which it looks like they absolutely will, if they really f f uh, fell back on that at this point, I think it would be uh, very embarrassing for them. So I think they do have to vote for impeachment, push it to the Senate. First person they're going to call is Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. So I think that will definitely tarnish his name going into the election period. So who the heck are we going to have? Uh, Pete Buttigieg, Bernie, Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg's speech was, uh, despite me actually really liking his policies, I just don't think anyone's going to vote for him. Very boring, no energy. Meanwhile, Trump's doing rallies with uh, rock and roll music and cursing and, you know, much more appealing to your, your average Joe. Uh, Elizabeth Warren's been falling in the polls rapidly. Um, so I may stop following her so closely unless she starts popping up again. Looks like she's been picking too many fights with the wealthy. Uh, some billionaires figured it might be cheaper to run for president than pay my wealth tax. Well, they don't have to have the power of a grassroots movement. And in our democracy, I believe in the power of people over money. And so if you do study the elections, uh, it's not the amount of money you spend that tends to win it. Uh, but there is a correlation that the one who does win uh, is happy to spend more money because they're winning in the polls along the way. And so we can just go look at the last election. I'll never forget every major media outlet telling us that there's a 95% chance Hillary was going to win. And the closer we got to, uh, to the end of the night, we got the news. Here is a piece out from Pelosi. Again, they're taking a tiny, tiny sliver in time and saying, you broke the law, we're going to impeach you. But when you expand the timeline, then you get the full picture. And I believe this will come out in the Senate trial. So it's, uh, it's remarkable that they're wanting to expose uh, what has happened in Ukraine. Um, but I guess it's the old, if you get caught, try to accuse them of the same thing uh, so that you don't get in trouble, I guess. Look at the charts, spy was at 314.80 before I started. Maybe it's at 315 by now. That was my price target on a hope of a trade deal. Looks like that hope is fading quickly. So we're just trying to lock in those profits and get ready uh, to use the inverted option call as soon as we have a catalyst. Now I won't short it till we do have a catalyst. I am tightening the option caller so the profits can generate from the TLT until we get the catalyst. Uh, so I'm not trying to guess when the catalyst will happen. I'm just trying to protect, uh, protect those profits. TLT had quite a sell-off over the last two months, uh, but it's back on track. And the big picture is the Fed has to push rates to zero, as well as all the central banks. Otherwise, the bond bubble pops. It's just that simple. If the bond bubble pops, governments aren't funded. Once those yields spike, stock market flows into the high-yielding debt, and then you've popped your stock market and bond market. So rather than let that happen right now, it looks like they want to delay it as long as they can. And uh, now they're trying to get clever about how to extend it even beyond going to zero. Emerging markets is not giving us the action of the spine. Emerging markets has been a decent leading indicator uh, for the stock market in the U.S. And I suspect that... Uh, there's no trade deal, and we're going to see a good little sell-off here uh, to close out the year. GDX has been pulling back a little bit in September after quite a rally this year. 
Uh, we've done well with GLD at first, so we got to the $1,500 spot, then we rotated into GDX. And the main thought is if central banks are going to buy up gold, they'll probably put a ceiling on gold around $1,500. They have unlimited money, so why not? Uh, but the gold miners benefit from mining at $1,500 an ounce. So we want to own the gold miners, not gold. Euro has been crashing against the dollar. The Japanese yen is also devaluing against the dollar. And China's CNH also devaluing against the dollar. It's the same problem worldwide. They went and created a bunch of debt in dollars. And now they're having to print their own money, convert it into dollars to pay their debts. The more they do this, the more expensive their debt gets, the worse the problem becomes. That's why we've got repo madness to my best uh, guess. And also, CNH has been a great leading indicator of trouble ahead from the stock market every time uh, China allows this to slip with natural for, you know, people say China's manipulating it. All they're doing is they're giving up on protecting this high conversion rate. Everyone knows this is nowhere near worth uh, $1 for 7 won. Uh, maybe a fair value is more around 10 or 14 won for a dollar, but it's certainly not worth 7. This puppy's devalued from 2 over the last several decades, and I suspect it won't find a fair value till uh, above 14. Now, why would they want to allow it to devalue? Well, they don't want their own currency. They, nobody wants that. So they need to make it attractive. They need to make it more open so that people can buy and sell it freely. Why? Because they want to convert that 210 trillion won into real money they can spend to buy commodities so they can put 1.4 billion people to work. And what do they want to do? They want to build stuff. That's what they're good at. And that's how they keep all these people happy. Gold's had a little bit of sell-off, but you can see not much. My expectation is it will bounce right back to 1500 pretty quickly once we get a little fear. I like to own gold if we have three magic ingredients. Number one, rates need to be traveling lower or at a super low rate. Check mark on that one. Next are the central banks printing money to buy bonds. Check mark, we've got that at rapid pace. Last ingredient is fear. So add a little fear, we're going to get a nice spike in gold. Uh, Crude's been traveling higher with the Aramco IPO uh, underway, um, but I suspect this will stay in the 60 range. If it gets too expensive, that's bad for the bond market. So if we get towards 70 or 80, that's when we most likely will see the TLT have a significant sell-off. On the other hand, if we see it go too low, that means trouble for growth, and I'd get scared about stocks. Anywhere between uh, really 58 and 68 is a pretty healthy range, uh, not only for both the stock market, bond market, but also the oil producers. All right, guys, that is a wrap for our presentation today. And if you haven't upgraded yet, call Dean. We're going to give you a free month in our boot camp. We're going to save you 40% on our annual program where you get all of the trade alerts Monday through Friday. So if stocks go up or down, you'll be doing very well with this program and we're gonna also get you the trade alert that's gonna hit this Friday uh, and next Friday that's gonna take advantage of the problem in China with the bank run so call Dean right now 505-322-7515 I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving thanks for your time and uh, just a review Friday we'll close out the TLT and the GDX trade the SPY trade covers us till Monday. So no spy trade this Friday. And we have our customer webinar coming up in an hour and 10 minutes. So thank you so much.